Welcome to the Aesthetic Doctor Podcast. We don't shy away and keep secrets here. We empower you with education, telling you the truth about all things aesthetic medicine while encouraging you to be the best version of yourself. It's time to look great and feel good doing it. This is your host, mom, speaker, and board certified physician, Dr. Judith Forger. Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 17 of the Aesthetic Doctor Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about hyperhidrosis or excessive sweating. Why do we talk about hyperhidrosis or excessive sweating on this podcast? Well, one of the reasons, hint, hint, spoiler alert, is that Botox is one of the things that can help hyperhidrosis or excessive sweating, but also because it's really one of those conditions that affects people, that affects their confidence, that affects how they show up in the world. And I think you're starting to sense a theme here. The emphasis for this episode was actually a patient that I'm treating with Botox for underarm sweating. And we had this great conversation on how it works. And she kind of said to me like, wow, I think a lot of people don't know about the treatment options for this and how well Botox works because she had almost complete resolution with just one treatment. And, you know, I took that as an invitation. So here we are. As a little disclaimer, I'm going to talk about something that's called idiopathic primary hyperhidrosis or hyperhidrosis. And why does that matter? So the reason it matters is that there's a lot of other medical conditions that can cause people to have night sweats or excessive sweating. So there's definitely some medications. Um, and then, of course, there are some medical conditions that cause sweating that isn't sort of caused by the sweat glands only. So meaning we all know about menopause, right? Um, thankfully, I hopefully, fingers crossed, knock on wood, have a couple more years statistically, like eight, before I go through menopause and have to go through all of that. But we know that hot flashes, night sweats are one of those things that women undergoing menopause complain about. We all know that certain tumors, um, that tuberculosis um, can cause night sweats, which is kind of why your doctors on the screens for it. Today, we're not going to talk about all of these because in those conditions, sort of Excessive sweating from the sweat gland isn't like the primary problem. There is this whole underlying thing that needs to be fixed. And again, that's why when you have a problem, you know, when you come to me for, quote, Botox, I'm going to ask you about your sweating pattern, ask you where it is. And it might very well be that I might be like, hey, you know, this sounds like we first should rule out X, Y, and Z. Do you have a primary care doctor? Has he checked your thyroid labs? So on and so forth. Again, this is why you should see a doctor. So, but getting back to excessive sweating or primary focal hyperhidrosis, let me just kind of give you a little bit of the definition of it. So basically it's sweating for at least six months of duration without an apparent cause, meaning without us thinking it's your hormones or something like that. In most patients, it's sort of bilateral and relatively symmetric. It does impair daily activities. And you can probably imagine that is that it's really distressing to people that have it. I mean, you know, first of all, people worry about sweat stains on their shirts. They worry about kind of being seen as not clean. They might avoid social different interactions, people that have sweaty hands, that have work that requires a dry kind of strong grip, might have limitations in their functions of work, or, you know, they might be self-conscious about shaking somebody's hand. Um, you know, uh, one of my patients, I have a couple that I treat with this condition, um, you know, works in the personal care industry, and she's very worried, like, hey, you know, I do this personal care work, I'm really close to people, like, I don't want you know, I feel judged. So it's a very impactful problem to the people that have it. Um, you know, it only affects about one to 5% of the population, which doesn't seem like that much. But I mean, there's billions of people in this world. So, you know, that's quite a few. And even, you know, hundreds of them, thousands of them. So that's, you know, you know, some people with this condition. In order to meet this, most people have at least one episode per week. And most people, it happens 
earlier in life, meaning it sets on earlier in life. Um, most people that have this focal sweating actually don't have it during sleep. And a lot of people do have a family history of idiopathic hyperhidrosis. So this is something that's thought to be genetically linked. But again, there's more that we have to figure out about this. Um, most people um, with this condition have symptoms in like certain places of their body. So very um, often localized to the palms of your hand, the soles of your feet or your underarms. We know that sweating, the purpose of sweat and sweating on your body is something called thermal regulation. So as we evolved long before air conditioning and heat and all of that stuff, certain biological mechanisms had to happen to help our bodies at, keep our bodies at its optimal temperature, right? Because if you think about the wide temperature that even the atmosphere can vary, we're kind of comfortable at a very narrow range. And I don't mean like Jane wanting the thermostat at 67 and Josh wanting it at 73. What I mean is like even winter, summer, all the elements that we're exposed to, we humans kind of like it in a very kind of tight range of temperatures. We don't have fur like dogs. I mean, again, I did a laser hair removal episode. <laughs> that was a bad joke. I apologize. But really, we don't have fur or anything that keeps our skin regulated and protected. So we do use sweating. And basically, you know, your skin secretes sweat as like a cooling mechanism, right? To prevent us from getting overheated. Um, Sweat actually also hydrates the skin and helps with the fluid and electrolyte balance of the skin. So there's multiple um, types of sweat glands in the body. Um, most notable, the apoecrine gland. Not that that really matters to you. Um, but the one thing that I do want to mention, and for those of you who have religiously listened to the podcast, I'm sure this word will mean something to you. Acetylcholine is the primary neurotransmitter that innervates sweat glands. Acetylcholine. Hmm, you might think, I've heard that, but where have I heard it? We have heard it in the Botox, Botox, Botox episode, talking about how Botox basically blocks acetylcholine. And Boom, here we have why Botox works for excessive sweating, but we will get into Botox as a treatment later. So when we talk about people with excessive sweating, let's kind of go through a little bit of a step-by-step treatment algorithm. So some of you who also might have this, like you might be like, wow, I'm embarrassed. I've never seen anybody about this. I don't even know what to do about it. Well, let me tell you sort of the algorithm of options that are out there so you can seek them out. So step one, first line therapy is obviously topical antiperspirants. Why? Well, that's easy to know, right? They're widely available, they're inexpensive, and they're well tolerated. So most commercially available antiperspirants that are non-prescription contain a low-dose metal salt, most often aluminum. And what that does is it actually physically obstructs the opening of the sweat gland duct. So if you have very mild hyperhidrosis, non-prescription antiperspirants are successful, right? I mean, that is like the average person. You sweat a little bit, you put deodorant on, everything is good. There is actually prescription antiperspirants out there too that are also considered first-line treatment. For example, as physicians, we can prescribe 20% aluminum chloride hexahydrate, which does that same thing. It physically plugs the ducts of the sweat gland. These um, prescription strength antiperspirants need to be applied to dry skin mostly once a day. And, um, you know, most of the time with mild symptoms, that is the next line therapy. Another topical therapy that is still considered first line is something called topical glycopuronium. And that is an anticholinergic drug, which basically inhibits sweating through inhibiting the action of acetylcholine on sweat glands. You basically get a 2.4% prescription of topical glycopuronium, and you apply it once daily to the axillary using like a pre-moistened cloth. 
Um, so there is, you know, a benefit to that. Um, there's some randomized trials that support it. You know, because it's applied topically, and some of the sweat glands are beneath the skin, that's kind of what limits its efficacy. And then, you know, side effects are um, what we would consider any anticholinergic side effects, meaning that part of your body probably took that up. And so you can get some dry mouth and some dilated pupils. But again, topical therapy, non-invasive, widely available is the first line for excessive sweating. So if you are listening to this and you've never treated what you consider excessive sweating, there's some really like low barrier to try kind of topical treatments out. If those fails, this is where Botox. So Botox is considered second line therapy for axillary and palmar and plantar, meaning the bottom of the feet, hyperhidrosis. So... Studies have shown that periodic uh, Botox injections into the affected skin is a safe and effective method for improving axillary um, hyperhidrosis. Like I've already said, um, Botox blocks the release of neuronal acetylcholine from the um, neurons. And so basically it reduces sweat production by blocking the release of acetylcholine. The FDA actually approved Botox for hyperhidrosis, for axillary hyperhidrosis, meaning for the underarms. There are um, multiple randomized trial that um, support the efficacy of Botox, like I said. Um, interestingly enough, the um, Botox for hyperhidrosis lasts longer than what is reported for wrinkles um, because... It lasted three to nine months or longer. When they did follow these patients, they, on average, the first injection series lasted 5.5 months and subsequent injections lasted 8.5 months. Um, and they're not really quite sure why the duration of this effect of Botox um, increased over time. But they basically think that um, the root growth of the axonal terminal might be lengthened after subsequent treatments. Again, there's more studies noted. They just noticed in some of these studies and when they followed people for like, I think they followed them for like almost three years, that as they were getting treated regularly, that the treatments, A, lasted longer as they were getting them, and B, that they lasted longer than let's say, the average duration for Botox for things like forehead wrinkles. It is important to know that people got anywhere from 50 to 100 units per axilla. So, you know, when people come to me for a Botox treatment, it's one of the things that we have to kind of talk about, that it does take a significant amount of units. So, even though it's so worth it and it lasts so long, you know, it is for most people a little bit more of a costly treatment than let's say the first line treatment. Um, and then of course there's needle sticks involved, even though they go just like under the skin and we use tiny needles. Um, I, for both underarms, I of course use topical numbing. It's not an injection I do without topical numbing. And then for hands and feet, we can either do topical numbing, we can do vibration devices, we can do nerve blocks, we can do all sorts of things to make it as comfortable as possible. Another treatment for excessive sweating is something called microwave thermolysis. A lot of people know it as like a mirror dry. And basically... What they do is in this therapy is they use microwave energy to destroy sweat glands and relieve hyperhidrosis in the underarms. It is FDA approved. It's commercially available. There are some studies on it that are not like that amazing in quality. But again, um, people that suffer from this condition um, that see an improvement really like the improvement. But I do have to honestly say that when we look at the trial, there wasn't that much objective statistics significant for the treatment. You know, the International Hyperhidrosis Society, which is a thing, kind of does 
recommend a stepwise approach. And, um, you know, some of the older treatment that you might have heard of and that some people still do maybe after people fail treatment or, you know, that are just out there that I want to mention is something called suction curettage, where they basically remove sweat glands physically, which, you know, sounds really great. However, um, when they've put this treatment head to head, Botox actually had a better result and had higher patient satisfaction because, you know, the other treatment was more surgical, the suction curettage, and actually, you know, nobody was able to remove all of the sweat glands. There was difference between surgeons or operators. I mean, it's just kind of like an older treatment that, as I say, when I say it sounds great, like in theory, people are like, oh, take out all my sweat glands. I don't have the problem, but in real life, that's not really kind of what happens. You know, people sometimes go on systemic therapies as well. Um, but really, then you have these anticholinergic effects on the whole body, which are really not that great. Um, because really, if you have a small part of your body that has excess acetylcholine, um, and then you flood your whole body, um, with anticholinergics, you know, you kind of have a lot of side effects. They do titrate it, but potential adverse effects of the anticholinergic agents include things like dry mouth, which is the most common, blurred vision, headache, and, you know, urinary retention, meaning having trouble peeing. Um, you know, so they don't really, in most cases, recommend um, long-term use of these and don't really there's not a lot of studies on the efficacy of safety for this indication because, again, we're talking about a small part of your body that has a problem and then taking something for your whole problem. Of course, there's also people that have very specific emotional events that cause them to have excessive sweating. You know, for example, the people that have a fear of speaking people that have some other um, physiologic or psychologic triggers. When we talk about systemic medicines, it's important for me to mention that there's people that have hyperhidrosis only in response to certain emotionally stressful to them events. For example, anxiety about public speaking is a great example, right? So for people that have very specific emotional triggers, they can also take things like beta blockers or benzodiazepines to reduce the emotional stimulus that leads to the excessive sweating. You know, again, in this episode, I really wanted to focus on people that feel like, wow, I stain my shirts a couple days a week every day and I don't want to walk around with sweat stains. I don't want to not feel like I can shake hands, which I need to do at my work with customers or clients because my hands sweat and so forth and so on. But anyway, that is how Botox works for excessive sweating. It's all in understanding pathophysiology and pharmacology. So acetylcholine, I think you guys could all now answer a Jeopardy question on, you know, which neurotransmitter does Botox inhibit, you know, for 500. What is acetylcholine? If you have any questions, as always, on excessive sweating, on anything in this episode, please let me know. I hope this was a useful overview, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Aesthetic Doctor Podcast with Dr. Judith Borger. We'd love to connect with you outside of the show. Follow Dr. Borger on Instagram at Dr. Borger and find more online and ways to work with Dr. Borger at www.theaestheticdoctor.com. Until next time, be well.